The 24 Shades of Blue Cold Case Edition is about real, ongoing investigations. The following conversation may be disturbing to some people and is not recommended for all ages. Viewer discretion is advised. Selfless, kind, and a ray of sunshine, that's how those who knew Candace Bob well, better known as Rochelle to those close to her, would describe her. On Sunday, May 15th, 2016, at around 10.50 p.m., while driving a friend home, Rochelle's car was shot at, ultimately ending her life in the process. A devastation her family not only had to endure once, but twice, as Rochelle was pregnant at the time of her death. Medical professionals were forced to remove her baby prematurely, and unfortunately, baby Kyrie also passed away 24 weeks after his mother's passing. Rochelle's life was cut short, but it was filled with laughter and love. We spoke to Rochelle's family to get a deeper understanding of who she was and how she impacted those around her. She was born um, at Mount Sinai on a Wednesday at about 1.31 p.m. And right away, we knew she was different because she was, she didn't cry much. And she, I have three children and she's a middle child and she's the only one that slept through the night from birth. You know, most babies stay up or they have a little bit of this or that. She never did. Was always very quiet, um, very attached to her older sister, Monique. Very, very attached to her dad. I mean, they had a relationship unlike no other. And it was just always, it's like, I didn't exist. It was just her and dad all the time. So uh, what I remember about her early childhood was um, I remember she was in kindergarten and um, it was her birthday. And back then they would give you a cupcake. And so, you know, she went to kindergarten in the morning. So it's from like 9 to 1130. So she'd uh, pick her up from school and she'd come home and she had the cupcake. And I said, well, can I have some? And she said, no, you have to wait for dad to get home because we have to share it. And, you know, she's, she's kind, she's very kind, but she's very quiet and she kind of like um, her space. She liked being alone at times, but never be separated from the family. Like if she's in the house, she likes to play with toys by herself, but she wants to know that somebody's always around. So, um, you know, she, she was always the, the little kid that everybody wanted to be friends with because, um, you know, she always looked out for the other little kids, even though she was small for her age at that time. <laughs> um, yeah, just just a good kid, just a very overall child, very quiet, very quiet. That's one of the things I can say. Compared to her older sister, oh, very, very quiet. Yeah, it's very quiet. Really good kid. All the teachers loved her. As Rochelle got older, she blossomed out of her shy self and became a beacon of joy and helpful to everyone around her. As happy as those memories are, it makes it that much harder to know not having her around. That's the hardest part of all this, is that everyone have a different story to tell about Ro. Like, she's that kind of a friend that, okay, for example, her and her aunt, my younger sister, they're very close. They look so much alike. I think they're maybe seven years apart. I'm, I can't remember right now. And I remember they lived close by each other and my sister wasn't feeling well. So by the time she got home from, from work, um, Rochelle was over there and drew a bath for her and put some candles and some flowers around. And she said, oh, I'm your husband until your husband gets here. Those little things. And I remember she had a friend, um, this guy, they grew up together and their main thing was to watch the soaps. So she could call him and get updated. He could call her and get updated. So they'd keep watching it for each other. And whenever we wanted to find out anything, birthdays, anniversary, whatever, she was always on top of that. So, you know, a lot of her friends really, really missed the impact of her. Um, everybody was been around her, especially when she laughs. And that's what everybody would say. If Ro was here, if Ro was here, because if you call her by her full name, like she would answer but. Uh, or she's angry and I would say Ro she said it's Rochelle I think when we have a fight and I said Ro I'm talking to you she go it's Rochelle I said I know what your name is I gave it to you so 
I, I miss those little banter back and forth. And her friends really miss her a lot. Her sisters misses her. Her nephew misses her. So we misses her, everybody. I ran into her principal um, uh, maybe a year or two ago, right around COVID time. And I didn't even remember her, to be honest. But when she she introduced herself, I said, oh, my goodness. Yes, Mrs. So-and-so. She's a principal when she went to a middle school. And she was standing and we we're just talking for a long time. And she said, I couldn't believe when I heard the news. She said to me, I got so sick, I couldn't get out of bed. And I was trying to get your number to reach out to you. But it's on Facebook. And so she said, you know, I have a lot of students in my class. And as a principal, before she was a principal, she was her teacher, a grade six teacher. And she said, but she stood out. Why? Number one, because she laughs a lot. Number two, um, she always remember me. She'd always come by and visit when she's in the area, things like that. So, yeah, she remembered these little things. This is 24 Shades of Blue, Cold Case Edition. Hi, my name is Anime, your host for this series. I'd like to welcome back acting detective Sergeant Steve Smith to the show. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for having me. So this was a, a complete devastation and has fully impacted her family and the community. Can you tell us the, what happened the day of the murder? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a terrible, terrible murder. This is one that affected the whole community of Toronto. Um, an innocent woman just driving home and pregnant as well um, and loses her baby in the, the meantime with, with the shooting. So on the night in question, um, Rochelle was out with a couple of friends. They went to a basketball game. One of her friends had played in a basketball game down on Lawrence Avenue. They drove up because they were going to drop off one of their friends on um, up in the Jamestown area. And they drove down the street. They went to turn around so they could drop him off in front of the house. And as they pulled up in front of the house, um, someone unknown fired four bullets into the car. Um, everyone in the car obviously yelled, drive, drive, as the, the shots were ringing out. Um, and as they drove away, they found out that uh, the Candace had actually been hit with one of the bullets. And so we're looking at a photo right now in this picture. What street is this? And is this a shot where where the shooting happened? Yep, that's Jamestown Crescent at uh, John Garland Boulevard. So just down the street there where they turned around, that's where they were actually shot at. Right, yeah. So I see a lot of houses there and it, it looks like there are parks around on, on either side. Yeah, the Jamestown area, is a, it's a small um, townhouse community. There's some tall apartments in there as well, but most of it is low-rise townhouses um, spread out over a distance uh, right across Jamestown area. So it's, a, it's an entire neighborhood, uh, very densely populated. Um, a lot of people live in the area. And so did Rochelle normally frequent this neighborhood? Well, I mean, some of her friends did. Some of her friends lived in the area. So when she came to Toronto, she actually lived outside of Toronto. But when she came into Toronto, obviously, she'd visit with some of her friends. And as I said, they went to a basketball game that night. They watched the game. There was games going on. They'd actually watch some other games before they came back to drop their friend off. So it was just a matter, of course, of, of people living in the community and her visiting her friends. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just looking at this next photo. I see it's the car. I'm assuming that it's her car. Can you describe what it looks like and what's inside? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a car. There's a t two bucket seats up front. In the back, there's the three seats. There's a, a child seat in the back. Um, thank God there wasn't another child in the vehicle. But you can see as the markers show there where the shot went through the car and with Rochelle sitting there in the back seat like that, it would have went right through her and into the uh, into the back seat of the vehicle. And so how many shots did you say there were? Well, there were four shots that actually hit the vehicle. Mm -hmm. How many other shots were fired, we're not really sure of. But there was at least four that hit the vehicle and one that uh, one that hit Rochelle, unfortunately. And do we know that whether the shots came from one source or were there many guns? We believe that it was one firearm. So we don't believe that there was a gunfight going on. We believe that it was actually one firearm that was discharged at the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, what the purpose of that? There's a, a number of different theories that that could be. It could have been somebody um, involved in, in gang activity that was looking for someone in the community to shoot at because that does happen. Gangs from one community will go to another community and, uh, and shoot people in the community. Or it could have been as simple as um, the community itself 
uh, being on edge because of shootings that have happened back and forth between communities. And they didn't recognize the vehicle that was in their community. Once a vehicle turned around and pulled up slowly in front of the townhouses, they may have thought that this vehicle was going to then fire on people in the community as well. Oh, so that's interesting. Yeah. So they're just, it's just a new vehicle potentially in the area and therefore it's a threat. Yeah. Sometimes, unfortunately, um, where gangs do operate, um, there's both those threats of, of other gang members coming into the community and shooting innocent people that um, they may either target as gang members or they're just targeting a community at large. It doesn't matter who's there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other, the flip side of that is people in a community will understand that people are coming to their community with, with bad intentions and arm themselves to protect their community. So if they don't recognize a vehicle or people in the community, it could be dangerous to those people as well. And, and so what's so interesting is that when I, we were looking at the picture of the car, it did for me, it didn't look threatening at all. It looked like a normal sedan. What, what color was it? Uh, uh, black. Oh, it was a black sedan, but the the windows weren't shaded. I don't, you could see right through it. And you said there were four people in the car. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, it's so odd that we would consider this like a, a, just a four door sedan to be threatening right off the bat. Yeah. I mean, that's using uh, your rationale though, right? Uh, some of these people, especially people involved in, in a gang culture, um, their rationale isn't isn't up to speed. They just see a, a vehicle that they don't recognize in the community. I mean, this could have been a police vehicle for all they knew, right? That could oh, be that's a good point. Yeah. It could have been anybody coming up. Um, so why they would start shooting, we don't really know. I mean, obviously, if we were to find the people, these would be questions we'd ask, not that they would necessarily answer them. Mm -hmm. um, but these are all questions that we go through as we're investigating these these homicides. So, but I mean, relationships run really deep uh, with with the people in the car where any of their family and friends associated with gangs. There must have been some sort of targets. Yeah, no, we don't believe that they were targeted specifically. Um which makes it all the, the the worse. I mean, they were just innocently in the wrong place at the wrong time when the shooting happened. Um, why someone would go to these sort of means and end up killing a, an innocent female and her young baby, we don't know. Um, but I'm sure there's people that do know who did this and and why this was done. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that there were four shots in the car, maybe some shots outside. What evidence did you find? Well, I mean, usually in shootings, there isn't a whole lot of evidence. So you'll have um, the slugs from the the actual shooting. That what are slugs? They're the, um, the, the bullets, basically, the spent bullets that uh, lodge themselves in the vehicle. And sometimes you will have shell casings if the person wasn't shooting out of a car or a house or somewhere that was concealed. If they were shooting from out on the street, you will have shell casings. Um, but in reality, that and video is the only thing that you have. Mm -hmm. But even with the shell casings, I mean, did it tell you anything about the type of gun or the type of weapons that they were using? Shell Shell casings will tell you the type of gun and they'll tell you um, that it's been fired from the same um, weapon. Um, as far as forensics, sometimes we get DNA off of shell casings. Sometimes we get fingerprints off shell casings. Um, but it really depends. It really depends on on where they're located, uh, the weather out that night, um, any sort of environmental factors. There's a number of things that come into play there. Um, but we can sometimes glean some evidence off of shell casings. So, Steve, I need to ask, did you get any evidence off of these shell casings? No, unfortunately, we don't have it. There's a few new tests. Uh, uh, science, every six months or so, science advances. So there are some new tests that we've been utilizing for shell casings. And we're hoping to develop some evidence that way. And these are all cases that we're sending back to, uh, to re-examine. Is it just DNA testing and DNA evidence of touching the shell case. Yep, it's it's basically forensic evidence. So there's new means of uh, of creating forensic evidence off of shell casings that we're utilizing to try to uh, try to give us a lead on who the shooter may have been. And so you know, with our listeners, is there anything that we can tell them to help support this case? Um, I mean. Everybody knows about this case. Well, like when Rochelle was shot, this was a huge event in Toronto. And obviously, as it should be, an innocent young woman pregnant shot up in a in an area of Toronto uh, for no reason other than she's in the area. Um, 
people do know what happened here, um, especially if it's members of gangs that did do this shooting. Um, other members in the, that were in the gang at the time, um, maybe girlfriends, boyfriends, would know exactly what happened here. And as we've stated a number of times, you know, um, relationships change and they change over the years. And as things go on, people move in different directions and people may have information that they could provide us in this that, that we could utilize to hopefully bring the person before justice and charge them. If I was a person of the public, though, I'd be a little fearful, especially if this is gang related. What would I do to to ensure my safety? Absolutely. I mean, Crime Stoppers is always available and it can be it can be utilized through a phone call, through the Internet an email can be sent. Um, It anonymizes everything. Our concern isn't who's sending the information. We don't need that information. What we want is the information that someone may have. So please, if you have anything, send it to us. I mean, this is something that that every person in Toronto um, would want to see the person that shot Rochelle and Kyrie um, put before justice and and be able to have to explain themselves as to why they did what they did that night. Mm -hmm. I want to end off this podcast with some final words from Rochelle's mother, Jacqueline. So let's, let's move to that. Okay. You know, I just want people to know the general public in general, especially the community of uh, Martin Grove, Jamestown, that she's just not a lost person. She has parents. She has a family. She has friends. She's much loved. You know, um, we need answers. You know, she could be your sister. She could be your friend. She could be your daughter. And somebody knows something because one day maybe the tables will turn and they need our help. They need the public help. And this is a thing with with the Black community. You know, they're free to talk to the police, but we need the police to, to for crimes and to help with these kind of problems. And we need community to come together and and, and just talk. You know, th- there is um, a $50,000 reward that was offered um, on the anniversary of her date, um, I think it was a year after. And it's still out there. You know, go to Crime Stoppers. Um, it's anonymous. Just Just tell somebody because we know that somebody knows something. We know that that person that does it is is probably listening to um, following the news. You know, murder, there's no timeline on murder. There's no, you know, it, it's for life. Murder, there, there's, there's, like I said, there's no timeline on that. And we need answers. Her children need answers. Like, we're hurting here. And next Monday, the 15th, will be seven years. And what we do each anniversary, we're at our gravesite. We're there for birthdays. We're there Mother's Day. We're on the day. And, and I mean, everybody throughout the day, you know, you know, all the lives that she has touched, people are there just to just to pay their respect to her and just to remember the kindness. Like she's wanted. She's a she's my child. She's my child. And for her death to just go unsolved like that, I, I need answers before I go to my grave. And we're just asking the community of Jamestown, anyone who knows anything at all, anything at all, even though you think it's not important, just little details, we need answers. So there's a $50,000 reward, like I said before, and you could call Crime Stoppers if you don't want to leave your name and number. Whatever information that you have, I'm a mother, I'm pleading, I'm pleading for someone to give us some answers, to give us some details, some clues, something, because we need answers. We, we need answers and I'm not going to stop fighting. I'm not going to stop searching and I'm, I'm not going to stop until we get something. You know, this is such a recent case and, and the whole community and Rochelle's family is still mourning. And if anyone out there knows anything, all we can say is just just please come forward and to give some closure or just some answers to to everyone. So Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Acting Detective Sergeant Steve Smith, for joining us. And thank you to all of you. Uh, Thank you for listening to 24 Shades of Blue.